Hi, I'm Nora O'Donnell, and this is Person to Person. Our guest today is Adam Grant. Now, in my research, I discovered there are two different kinds of doubt. There's self-doubt and idea doubt. Adam Grant is a best-selling author and a leading expert of organizational psychology, the study of how we can be our best selves in our careers. Adam Grant. At age 28, Grant became the youngest tenured professor at the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. Growing up in Michigan, his parents, a lawyer and a teacher, taught him to never quit. Well, that tenacity even led him to becoming a junior Olympic diver. Grant attended Harvard and got his PhD from the University of Michigan in just three years. He's written seven books, and his latest, called Hidden Potential, focuses on the ability to grow by focusing not on what talents you are born with, but what character you can cultivate. To start the new year, we wanted to learn more about unlocking potential, so we sat down with Adam Grant for an intimate, person-to-person -person conversation. Thank you so much for joining us. You are out with your newest book, your sixth, Hidden Potential. So what was the inspiration? Well, the original inspiration was noticing that a lot of people who lack natural talent at an activity just give up. And they think, this is not for me. And that means they're underestimating themselves. And also, we do this to other people, too. We do this to students in school. We say, if you're not a prodigy, you're not going to be a genius. We do it to athletes in sports. Um, if you're not a natural, you probably should just walk away. And I think that is a huge mistake, because we end up counting out a tremendous number of underdogs and late bloomers. And I wanted to, to try to look at what does it take to recognize and realize hidden potential in ourselves and in others, too. At the beginning of the new year, we always look at New Year's resolutions. So how does someone unlock their hidden potential? Well, I think the mistake that a lot of people make is they feel like imposters. Um, they walk around thinking, you know what? Other people may believe I'm capable of certain things, but I know this is not for me. What they don't realize is that imposter syndrome, feeling like other people are overestimating you, is actually a sign of hidden potential. It means that other people have recognized a capacity for growth in you that you are not aware of yet. And so I would start by saying if other people believe in you, it's probably time to believe them. I found that incredibly empowering, and I think a lot of other people will be. And you really talk about great examples in the book that I think people can relate to. One of the most stunning things, I think, was reading about Steph Curry. <laughs> I mean. Steph Curry is probably one of the greatest basketball players of all time. And as you point out, the son of an NBA player, he didn't receive a single scholarship offer in high school, and yet now a record setter. How is that possible? What were the steps that he took? Well, I think there's a lot we can learn from examples like Steph Curry, but I, I really wanted to start with the evidence and ask, what does the science tell us about how to, how to develop a skill that you seem to lack naturally? And one of the things I learned from the research is that people who recognize hidden potential, who exceed expectations, consistently seek out and embrace discomfort. They are willing to put themselves in situations where they're going to fail, where they're going to look stupid, where they're going to embarrass themselves um, in the spirit and service of growth. And you can see this in Steph Curry. There's an amazing example in high school where he's just getting shot after shot blocked. And his dad sits him down one day and says, look, if you want to elevate your game, you've got to stop releasing the ball from your hip, where all these defenders who are taller than you can block it. You need to get a high release shot that comes from shoulder height or above. So what does Steph Curry do? He starts doing that, and his shot falls apart. But Steph Curry is so determined to get better that he spends months shooting poorly in order to get as accurate with the high release as he was with the low release. And that ultimately changes his game and elevates him into a college caliber player. And, and he just keeps growing from there. Um, and I think, Nora, the lesson from that is that discomfort is not only a sign that you're pushing yourself and stretching beyond your strengths, it's also a catalyst for growth. Adam, I really liked your chapter called Creatures of Discomfort, where you talk about polyglots. And you write, they get comfortable by being uncomfortable. And the best way to accelerate growth is to embrace, seek, and amplify 
discomfort. I mean, their superpower is they can speak multiple languages and it has nothing to do with their natural abilities. Really? I was stunned by it too, honestly, Nora, because I thought you need a language gene in order to become one of those people who can think and talk in six or seven languages fluently. And then I met Sarah Maria Hasboon and Benny Lewis, um, neither of whom could learn a foreign language successfully in school, um, despite trying repeatedly, and now have gone on to speak between them more than a dozen languages proficiently. And I was really curious about what, what did they do you know, as adults to master a skill that they couldn't pick up as kids when, when the critical period was supposedly open. Um, and one of the things they did was they both decided to make themselves uncomfortable. Um, Benny's an extreme example of this. When he wants to learn a new language, he will go to a foreign country and start just speaking from day one. Um, and he doesn't, he doesn't understand a word of it, but he will memorize a phrase just introducing himself. And what happens then is people start to talk to him. And he picks up the language through using it. And a lot of people believe they've got to master the language before they start speaking it. Well, the opposite is true. If you're willing to embrace and accept that discomfort of, of using words you're not quite familiar with, that's when you actually start to internalize it and practice it. And, and Benny takes this to an extreme. His goal is to make 200 mistakes a day. And the reason he's trying to make 200 mistakes a day is he knows that if he makes a couple hundred errors, he's actually forcing himself to talk in a language that he hasn't yet acquired, and that's how he acquires it. So um, I think a lot of people will say, you know, um, if you don't use it, you lose it. And I would add that if you don't use it, you might never acquire it in the first place. Our um, society um, puts a lot of weight on success, winning, leaders. But you write about in the book that success should be measured in the distance traveled. How do you measure that? What's the goal? Well, I think the goal is growth. Um, and I think growth is an achievement in and of itself. Um, I think so many people say, you know, I, I haven't reached the peak that I was shooting for, or other people have outperformed me, and therefore I'm a failure. Um, I'm disappointed in myself. I'm letting other people down. The reality is that the ultimate mark of your character um, and your potential is how far you've climbed, not how high you've gone. Um, and what that means is we need to spend a lot more time rewinding and considering where did I start? You know, if, if me five years ago knew what I would accomplish now, how exciting would that have been? How proud would I have been? And I think getting in touch with your past self that way is a great way to appreciate um, and savor some of your current achievements. And that makes it easier then to continue staying motivated for future growth. I thought this could be very helpful to people because you talk about in the book this perfectionism spiral. I dog-eared this particular page because Try something new, make a mistake, I'll never do it again. And the spiral of this just turns into, and you say, warning may cause stunted growth. Perfectionism and the, and the um, desire to achieve it actually leads to stunted growth. It's not achievable. The evidence on this is, is striking. Perfectionists get better grades in school, but they don't do any better in their jobs if you look at their performance. Um, and I think one of the reasons for that is in school, as a perfectionist, you can figure out exactly what's going to be on the exam. And you can pour all of your energy into memorizing everything you need to know. But in life, nobody tells you what's on the test. There may not even be a test. So perfectionists end up trying to ace the things they can control. And maybe they memorize the right answers, but they're asking the wrong questions. Um, they're also more vulnerable to burnout than the rest of us because they're constantly beating themselves up for the little things that they got wrong. Um, and they do end up narrowing their, their, their skill sets over time because they want to avoid failure at all costs. And that means if they think they might not excel at something, if they can't ace it, why should they bother trying? All right, when we come back, more ways to unlock your hidden potential with Adam Grant. And we're back with Adam Grant. There are so many good examples of people with hidden potential in this book. Diamonds in the rough, as you say. What do they have in common? Well, I think one of the things they have in common is unusual character skills. I think most of us look at people who accomplish great things and we think that they're geniuses, uh, that they have superior cognitive ability. Um, that is often not the case. Um, what they have are the character skills 
to, to override what might be their basic instincts. Um, and I think over and over again, what we see in the data is that character skills can beat cognitive skills. Um, they can allow people to transcend what might be their natural talents. And I think that you know, this is especially important now because we've talked for, for centuries actually about how um, cognitive skills are what elevate us above animals, our ability to think and reason and learn. And I, I think, Nora, that's the other thing I would say is when, when we look at character skills, it's not just about having clear values. It's about maintaining those principles when the, when the odds are stacked against you. So if personality is how you show up on a typical day, character is how you show up on a hard day. I underlined and highlighted that line in the book. <laughs> I thought that was incredibly empowering for people. You also write about the Golden 13, the first officer training course for black men in the US Navy. They faced enormous discrimination and yet they achieved success and were history making. Yeah, I think they graduated from officer training school with the highest grade point average in, in Navy history. Um, and they did it in the face of all kinds of obstacles, not only discrimination, but also um, a shortened training period and a series of, of instructors who weren't necessarily prepared to teach them. So what did they do? Um, I think a lot of people would say, you know what, I'm being doubted, I'm being underestimated, um, that this is really not gonna work out. Um, but they came together as a group and they said, let's use these low expectations as fuel. So the Golden 13 are on their own, they get together and they say, OK, let's each volunteer for something um, to teach to the rest of the group. And what they discover is they remember it better after they have to retrieve it from their knowledge over and over again to explain it. And also, they understand it better through the process of explaining it. So Nora, I, I actually think this is something we could all apply. Um, when you want to learn a new skill, you don't have to go to the person who's the expert or who's the master. What you can do is gather a group of people who also want to learn that skill and start teaching each other, and you will see your knowledge grow as you share it. Yeah, I loved that example. I think many people have heard about, you know, people that are sponges in life, right? They tend to suck up everything, and they can be experts or knowledgeable in many fields. One person you write about is our friend Melody Hobson, who is a great example of being a sponge. She is now chairwoman of the board of Starbucks, but she didn't learn to read until second grade. What is it about Melody and her approach to learning new information, do you think, that has made her successful? Well, Melody, Melody had some amazing mentors. Uh, I think of John Rogers and Bill Bradley, for example. But John and Bill mentored a lot of people. Uh, what was different about Melody was she actively sought them out um, and created opportunities to learn from them that might not have even crossed their mind. Uh, so John, John Rogers, for example, um, would go to, he'd go to McDonald's on Saturday mornings for breakfast, and Melody followed him there. So she could sit with him and just watch him read the Wall Street Journal. And in the process of doing that, picked up all kinds of knowledge about Wall Street that, that just before then um, was really outside of her grasp. Um, and I think that proactivity is something that you see throughout Melody's career that she's not just waiting for other people to teach her, she's going out of her way to seek out and absorb that knowledge, and then she's passing it along to others, which of course only reinforces it. Mm -hmm. You also talk about in the book, don't ask for feedback, ask for advice. This is, this is one of my favorite lessons from recent research, um, and it's also one that I've, I've gotten to live personally. When I first started teaching, I was afraid of public speaking, and I knew I had to get better. So I volunteered to give guest lectures for my friends' classes, and then I gave out feedback forms afterward. And the feedback was massively unhelpful. But in asking for feedback, what I now know is I was encouraging my audience to focus on the past, which meant that I had cheerleaders and critics. The cheerleaders were applauding my best self. The critics were attacking my worst self. And I didn't know what to do with any of that information. What I needed to do instead was to ask for advice, which was to say, what's the one thing I can do better next time? And what the research shows is that when you ask people for advice, instead of looking backward, they shift their attention forward. And they give you much more detailed and specific suggestions for what you can change. And that's how we really get other people to become our coaches. Um, and that's what we want. I think everybody needs coaches around them. And I think a great coach is somebody who sees your hidden potential 
and then helps you become a better version of yourself. All right, when we come back, Adam Grant tells us more about his own story of persistence and what he learned from it, plus what he means about scaffolding and playing Tetris. That's next. And we're back with Adam Grant. I want to talk about your own athletic career because I love that you tell the story of the summer that you spent all day inside playing video games. And a lot of moms can relate to that. And your mom dragged you to the pool and you tried to join the high school diving team and you were flat out bad. And yet you became a national champion. How did that happen? Well, just to be clear, I, I made nationals, which was for me a huge achievement. But uh, I got a lot better than I thought I would ever get. I was really lucky to have a coach, Eric Best, who, uh, who helped me overcome one of the, really the most vicious effects of being a perfectionist, which is I would walk down the board, do my approach, and jump to the end. And then I would stop, uh, which is called a balk. And I would balk over and over. And that was really holding me back. So one day, Eric asked me, Adam, are you going to do this dive? And I was like, ever? Yes, of course, one day I'm gonna do this dive. And he said, great, then what are you waiting for? Nora, I have heard that voice in my head every time I've hes hesitated to try something. I've heard it whenever I was afraid of trying something new. And what Eric taught me in that experience was that I think a lot of us wait until we've built the confidence to take the leap. And the reality is, that's backward. You earn the confidence by taking the leap. And I, I just think that's such a powerful lesson. Um, it's, it's a literal lesson in diving, right? I had to take the leap in order to learn that I could do it. Um, but in life, the same thing is true, that, um, that when you, you take on a new challenge or you pursue a risk or you try something that you're not good at yet, um, you gain the experience and you build the knowledge and skill to then believe in your own capabilities. I have to ask you about, as a mother of three children, how do you instill the idea of potential over winning? I don't know, Nora. I just study this. <laughs> I feel like I'm muddling through it as a parent, just like the rest of us. <laughs> but Adam, I know. I mean, it's so good. It's so good to reap that. I'm like, I need takeaways. How do I do this? How do I, how do I encourage my children that growth is the goal, not, you know, winning the game or that growth and potential is the goal, not an A or, you know, a B plus or whatever it may be? Well, I, I don't think you actually have to pit the two against each other because, mm. uh, look, we live in a world that measures performance. We talk about what grade you get in school and how many goals you scored in the game. I think what you can do, though, is, is help kids connect the dots between progress and long-term performance and say, look, if you want to be successful in five years, the most important thing for you to pay attention to today is not the result you got, but actually the distance you traveled. And once they, they see that progress, um, it allows them to recognize, you know what, that's actually a big part of what's going to allow me to perform the way I want to in the future. What is scaffolding? Oh, well, I mean, literal scaffolding is what construction crews need to reach a new height on a building. Um, and it's a temporary structure. It also turns out to be a great metaphor for how learning happens, which is a lot of us think you know, are, uh, in order for, for a kid especially to improve, um, what they need is they need that, that one teacher or they need to win the parenting lottery or they need a mentor who's going to be with them for five years and give them permanent guidance and support. Well, guess what? We don't need that. What we need is much more like scaffolding, which is we need the temporary structure where somebody gives us initial instruction and confidence and then removes the support so that we can direct our own growth. In this same chapter, you also talk about Tetris. And I played a lot of Tetris, the game, as a kid, but I didn't realize it could be psychologically helpful. I didn't either. I think the, 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 there are a couple of disclaimers that I have to put on the table first, which is there are therapeutic benefits of playing Tetris, but they're very specific. So playing Tetris is not going to cure your PTSD. Um, it's not a substitute for therapy or for medication, um, to my knowledge. But there are multiple carefully done randomized controlled experiments showing that if you see an upsetting image, um, like you're watching the news and you see something you wish you hadn't seen, 
that if you were randomly assigned to play Tetris in the 24 hours afterward, that you are significantly less likely to have intrusive thoughts in the next week. Why is that? Yeah, this is so surprising. It's not true for other games, uh, a lot of other games. It's not true for just taking a break or relaxing. It seems to be that playing Tetris actually disrupts the formation of the visual image in your memory. So it blocks you from, um, from crystallizing the scene that you don't want to see. And because that memory doesn't get consolidated, it's less likely to, to then bounce back when you least expect it. Yeah, I mean, I thought that was one of the most interesting things in this book. As you say, the scaffolding that psychologists offer to boost resilience is a game of Tetris. It has a specific benefit. It changes how your brain constructs mental imagery. Going to download some kind of an app today that has Tetris on it. I don't know, so it's on my phone for the future. Adam, as we wrap up, I guess I want to ask and end on this. If readers could take away one main lesson um, from your new book, what would it be? One lesson, Nora? Oh, it's a, I mean, this is like choosing a favorite child. <laughs> How could you do that? Uh, we both have three, always choose the middle child because they're at risk of <laughs> being overlooked. I'm a middle no, child. Um, I'm a middle child. I'm okay with the middle. <laughs> there you go. Done. It's all yours. <laughs> I loved it, Adam. Thank you so much. I think so many people in the new year um, will read this book and find some really helpful information. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thanks, Adam Grant. <laughs> <laughs> thank you.